we celebrate this season of Christmas together, let's join our voices in remembering the good news that the angels spoke to the shepherds. The first Noel, the angels did say, was to certain poor shepherds in fields as they lay. In fields where they lay keeping their sheep on a cold winter's night that was so deep. No. That's right. I thought it was my fault. We're glad that you're here. I guess it's afternoon now, but we're glad that you're here regardless. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we've got the opportunity to gather together to worship, and so it's a great day. I'm glad that you're here. My name's Brian. Uh, I've been here before, so you may recognize me. The pastor uh, was not able to be here today, and so I'm standing in his place, and count that as a privilege and honor. Uh, we're looking forward to seeing what God does in our midst. In history, we see other ancient mythical gods show up in thunderstorms or hurricanes or fires. But the true God, our God, chooses to come to earth through the mess and stress of human labor and childbirth. Born is the King of Israel to us a savior is born. And so while giving and opening and receiving presents is a wonderful way to experience the joy of this season, I'm wondering if the message, the mystery, the ethos of Christmas is better experienced anytime hope invades chaos, anytime hope collides with darkness. And so as we, the body of Christ, as we journey through the season of Christmas together, how can we come alongside those who are suffering loss or pain or stress? How can we bring life and light to darkness like our God did for us? Let's continue singing together. Oh, you've come to bring peace, to be loved. To be nearer to us, so you've come to bring life, 
to be light, to shine brighter in us. So Emmanuel, God with us, our Deliverer, you are Savior, in your presence we find our strength. simple and slow that even the dirt and wind had a smell to it. The cool air would float across the freshly cut grass to fill your nose with something so familiar that it had the power to help you forget. There was no homework. It seemed like the sun would stay out until 11. You would run to the playground and play for hours. You'd make your way around the park getting your fill of every last piece of equipment. You gotta squeeze everything you can out of this beautiful summer day. The swing? You save the swing for last. The swing is where you can take flight. Launch yourself without a care, willing to forget all the laws of physics just to feel free, floating through the air, fearless. To you, there were no consequences to this bold, beautiful act of letting go. Because you know that dad hasn't dropped you once. He never will. I had a seminary professor um, tell me that any good sermon has three points in a poem. 
by his standard, this is not going to be a good sermon. Uh, because this morning we really just have one point. I want us to look at a passage of Scripture and walk through it from beginning to end, kind of gleaning what's happening around us so that we might come to the same one conclusion that the people in the story came to. Now, our text is Joshua chapter 4, verses 1 through 7, but it's a small part of a much larger story. And so even before I, want to, even before I read the, the verses, I want to put them in their historical context. So Joshua is a book about God's people taking the promised land as God provided for them. What we learn in this first few chapters of the book is that um, the 40 years of wandering is over. Moses has died and Joshua is now in charge. The entire nation of Israel, all 12 tribes, is resting on the shores of the Jordan River so that in the morning they can go through it and take possession or begin to take possession of the land God has promised them. The, the river is at flood stage, we're told, and so it's moving much faster and it's wider and deeper than it might be at other points of the year. And the people of God can see off in the distance the city of Jericho, the first city that they would encounter, and its fortified walls are there. We read about how they follow the Ark of the Covenant into the water and that God backs up the waters so that they can walk across on dry land. And then they step out on the other side in chapter 4 where we pick up the story. Chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. When the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Choose twelve men from among the people, one from each tribe, and tell them to take up 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan, from right where the priest stood, and to carry them over with you, and to put them down at the place where you will stay tonight. So Joshua called together the 12 men he had appointed from the Israelites, one from each tribe, and said to them, Go over before the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan. Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of Israel, to serve as a sign among you. In the future, when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. It's the word of God. I wonder what that would have been like to have been part of the people of God taking possession of the promised land. I wonder what that, might, that experience would have been like. Now, anytime we read a narrative in the scripture, it's important to remember that it's not a story that's made up, but it's a real life historical event. These verses were lived by real people, by real families going through real adventure each and every day. They don't know Joshua chapter 5 yet because they're still living in Joshua chapter 4. And so when you come across a narrative in the scripture, I think it's important to step inside of the story for a moment. Not to bring your own feelings or, or impressions, but just to look around a little bit, to see what you see, to imagine what they must have been feeling. What must it have been like to be part of the people of God who were finally, after all these years, going to take possession of the promised land? Imagine that night before as they're on the shores watching that ferocious moving river go past them. I don't know what people were talking about, but I can imagine somebody would say, isn't this amazing? Isn't it great that we're finally getting to do this? And I also imagine that there would be somebody that would, that would say, oh, I don't know. I'm pretty nervous about that. I mean, I have children. I can't just be, I mean, well, I have to be careful. I can imagine somebody else saying, well, you know, uh, Moses was cool, but this Joshua, I mean, this is whole new for him, and I don't know if I really trust him. Someone is going to be nervous about those kinds of things, and I think that's where we can relate to the story. 
You've been, you've had night before experiences before, haven't you? I can, I can remember the first time I was going to tell my wife, I married late in life, I was 35. And when I decided this was the evening I was going to tell my then girlfriend that I loved her, uh, I had a little script in my mind. We were meeting that night. She lived about two hours from where I lived, and so we would meet in an Applebee's in the little town between us pretty regularly for dinner. And this was the night I was going to tell her. And as I began, I got real nervous, and I kind of started bumbling and stumbling, and she reached across the table and kind of patted my hand, and she said, Brian, I like being with you too. And I said, what? I love you. I just kind of blurted it out at that point. And I thought, by the look on her face, that she was going to throw up. Um, there was just this mixture of fear and nausea that was all over. And she told me later it was because she, um, while she knew her feelings, she was a little bit blindsided by mine. But I can remember the night before thinking, oh, it'll be fine. She's going to say, I love you too. It's going to be great. And then rolling over onto the other side and thinking, okay, this is going to go terrible. I'm going to die alone. And, and, and there was that constant battle. You've been in that experience. Our children just went through it a couple nights ago as they were looking forward to Christmas. What it must have been like to have been on the banks of the Jordan the night before. But what must it have been like walking through the river that morning? Again, I can imagine, probably a teenager, somebody said, you know, I don't want my shoes to get dirty. Um, there was all kinds of, I think, questions about what this was going to be like. I mean, the water stopped, but the riverbed is still going to be damp and muddy, I would imagine. I don't know. You know, I think there are two kinds of people in life. Those who eat their food and those who take pictures of it. I don't know if you have anybody in your life. I can't, I have a friend that I can't go to dinner with them because I'm half done with my meal and they're still taking pictures of how pretty their food looks. I don't understand that. Um, I, I, I'm a task-oriented person. We've come to eat. I have a fork. Let's get started. They're more of an experienced person. Oh, look how beautiful it is here. Well, I didn't come to look at beauty. I came to eat. Look how pretty the salad looks. It's lettuce. I, I, I just don't understand. And I would imagine that there were people in the nation of Israel. Could you imagine if they had cell phones? Don't you think somebody would take taking a selfie? Right, stand over here by the water, kids. Let's, you know. <laughs> I wonder what it would have been like to have been there. Would, would I have been focused on just getting across? We've come to cross. Let's go. Or would I have been awestruck by what was happening around me? I wonder what it would be like to step on that, the other side for the first time. To be in the promised land. I, I, I preached this sermon at, at uh, Church by the Sea this morning. I couldn't think of this word. I had a little senior moment. But I would imagine it would be very surreal. I don't even like that word. But this is a good use of it. Because they had heard their grandparents talking about this day. And their grandparents had heard it from their grandparents. They knew this day was coming, and we get to be ones that are actually doing what the people of God were prepared to do for decades. I don't know if you've ever had the privilege, or maybe it's a curse, uh, to take a group of teenagers to an amusement park. I was a youth director for a long time, and so I would do that every year. It was one of my least favorite days of the year. Because teenagers can't enjoy this ride for thinking about the next one. They can't enjoy what just happened. We survived that little thing they put up, held. It was fun, kind of, sort of. We were upside down for a while. That would, there's no talk about it. It's just, let's get to the next ride. I wonder again if there would have been people in the nation of Israel reacting that way. Wow, this is awesome. While others said, oh, look, Jericho's up ahead. We've got big problems ahead of us. I wonder what it would have been like. I don't know, but I have had those type of experiences, the night before experiences, the walking through the difficult time experiences, the getting through to the other side experiences. 
All of this discussion so far this morning is to get us to verse 5 and 6 because this is where the people of God ended up. This is what God said to them. He said, go back into the water and get a stone. Not a little one that says you're going to have to put it on your shoulder. Get a rock, get a boulder, and bring it back over to this side, and we're going to make a monument for what God has done here. Now think with me for a minute about that stone. It does not in any way affect what they experienced. God's message was not about the journey through the, through the riverbed. It was not about their fear of the future. It wasn't about their emotions or their attitudes or their conversation among themselves. The stone was to take their focus off of those things and focus it instead on the faithfulness of God. That's the one message. As we turn the calendar from 2020 to 2021, let's get a stone so that we don't forget the faithfulness of God. It's interesting to me that God sent them back into the river. So let's go back into 2020. It's almost trite to talk about how awful this year has been how difficult it's been for so many people. And even if you have somehow navigated the storm, it hasn't affected your job or your health or your... It, it's hard to imagine somebody that doesn't know somebody who's had a difficult year, either with health or with finances or just with fear. Go back in and get a stone. Let's not forget to get a stone. Go back and think about that financial hardship and get a stone so that you'll remember that God is faithful. Go back into that sickness and get a stone so that you'll remember that God was faithful. Go back into, and you know, let's go back beyond this year. Because a lot of us still worry about stuff that happened a long time ago, that, that choice we made in college that changed the course of our life, or that relationship that we didn't do well with, or we made a mistake with, or our children that didn't do what we wanted them to do and, and have brought shame to us, or whatever. Go back and get a stone. Because even in those moments, God has been faithful. I don't know what it would have been like for these people any more than I know what it's like for you. I don't know what experiences you encounter, what situations you have to navigate through. I don't know where you are on your journey, but I do know this, that God is always faithful to his people. And so in the midst of the new year, in the midst of the hand sanitizer and worry, in the midst of the circumstances of your past, don't forget the stones. Let's remember the faithfulness of God. Pray with me about that, please. Father, I don't know why you would be faithful to me when I am so consistently unfaithful my thoughts and my deeds my desires they don't always live up to what they should and yet you never ever ever lose sight of me you're always my father you're always faithful you always catch me when I jump thank you and help me to remember the stone so that I might remember the truth and the power of that, that you are faithful. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, there are lots of ways that you can be a part of the ministry that God is doing through this church. I'm sure there are places where you can give your time and your talent. There are also places where you can uh, participate in giving. Uh, three different ways to accomplish that, and they're on the screen for you, um, in person or by text or online, and I'll let you uh, see that before you. And I missed a slide. What did I miss? Uh, fall support drive. So thanks for supporting this ministry and, and being a part of what God is doing uh, through you and in you. You came 
Uh, there'll be a, uh, I'll give you a moment during our prayer time together to kind of pray specifically for the things that are on your heart and mind, and then we'll, we'll close with the Lord's Prayer. But pray with me, please. Father God, we thank you for your mercy and grace, for your love and for your kindness. We believe the Scripture that all good gifts come from you, and we know that even while we were yet sinners, you sent Christ to die for us. Thank you from uh, the bottom of our hearts, for teaching us in the Scripture from its first verse until its last. You remind us that you are God and that we are your children and that you are faithful to us. Help us to remember that in the midst of the circumstances of our lives. Father, in this moment of silence, hear our, hear our prayers. Father, I thank you for the truth that you listen to us. What an amazing truth that is. That the God of the universe hears my, my prayers. Thank you for always doing what's right and what's best and not just what I ask. As we pray the words that your son taught us to pray, may they, be, uh, may they speak truth to our lives. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily debt, and forgive us our debtors as we forgive our debtors. Not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, 
forever. Amen. What's next? Oh, well, that's easy enough. God bless. Thank you all for coming. Let me pronounce a benediction. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and with all those whom you love and with all those who know and love. Amen. Have a great day.